In this video, I'm going to talk with you about being called and being chosen. And I'm also going to address this issue of predestination. Someone asked the question uh, this evening, and it's actually the second time they've, they've brought this up. So um, it sounds like this needs to be clarified. And what they said was that this idea of predestination, that it reminds them of Calvinism. Well, I don't know anything about Calvinism, <laughs> to be quite frank. So I'm having to go look this up. And, um, and there's so much language. This is the problem with following man. They introduce constructs and concepts that simply are not in the Bible. So um, I'm reading from, I don't know, some Stanford article. As a logical corollary of his major premise, Calvin posits a view of absolute predestination. Like Luther, Calvin insisted that some men are elected for salvation and others for damn damnation. But Calvin goes beyond Luther in emphasizing this point. According to Calvin, God not only foresaw the fall of the first man, or in him the ruin of his posterity, but arranged all by the determination of his own will. And then it cites some footnote. In other words, God decreed the fall itself. This view is often spoken of as supra-lapsarianism in contrast to infra-lapsarianism, the view that God gave the decree of election after the fall of man. You know, to be quite frank, reading this is more confusing because now it introduced other concepts. Now I've got to go look up those concepts and understand that and then try to fit it into scripture and... Um, what does it matter? Like, I, I, I don't care about Luther or Calvin. I don't know who they are. They're no one to me. The only one who matters is God. The only word that matters is God's. So I'm not going to argue what Calvinism or Lutheranism or what John Knox was saying. I don't really care. The word I'm reading says, Paul planted the seed, Apollos watered it, but only God can make it grow. Okay, so Romans 9 verse 21 through 23. Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? Okay, so he's starting to address this. The potter is God. You're the clay. He has the right to make you into whatever he wants to make you into. And Paul's about to tell us that he made you into something before you were even born. He already predestined what you were going to be. What if God, although choosing to show his wrath, and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepa prepared for destruction. What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance, in advance, for his glory? Even us, whom he called, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Okay, so he prepared them in advance. And let's actually go a little further back to verse 16. It does not therefore depend on human desire or effort, but on God's mercy. For scripture says to Pharaoh, I raised you up for this very purpose that I might display my power in you and that my name might be proclaimed in all the earth. Therefore, God has mercy on whom he wants to have mercy and he hardens whom he wants to harden. One of you will say to me, then why does God still blame us for who is able to resist his will? But who are, who are you, a human being, to talk back to God? Shall what is formed say to the one who formed it, why did you make me like this? Does not the potter have the right to make out of the same lump of clay some pottery for special purposes and some for common use? What if God, although choosing to show his wrath and make his power known, bore with great patience the objects of his wrath prepared for destruction? What if he did this to make the riches of his glory known to the objects of his mercy whom he prepared in advance for glory? Even us, whom he also called, not only from the Jews, but also from the Gentiles. Okay, so I'm not sure why this, is, why this would be confusing, um, but I have a feeling that it has to do with not just reading the word directly and going to man's doctrines before reading the word, and now you're reading the word, but your lens has scratches on it, and now you can't see. It's very clear that we've been set apart for a purpose. We've been set apart to fulfill a particular role, we have been predestined. I mean, I don't know if we're arguing the limitations of the sovereignty of God, but that seems to be what was being argued in that article. Like, did God not know that Eve was going to sin? Was this not part of his plan? Does he not know what we're going to do? Does he not know what he has 
set us apart to do. I mean, this is kind of silly. It's put it placing limitations on God as though he doesn't know ahead of time and as though he's not doing something in order to re- reveal his glory. Now, part of the question that's being asked is, so why does God blame us? Well, because we have a role. God is not unilateral in the way that he thinks about things or the way that he understands things. He understands things from a multi-faceted and multi-layered perspective. So it is also possible. It is possible that he predestined us for a particular category. It's also possible that in order for us to be to fulfill our covenant and be saved, that we must obey, that we must bear fruit. And we're told exactly why he's doing this. It's not because he's playing some game with us. It's because he wants us to understand. He wants to reveal his glory to us. He wants to bring us into a position where we understand in humility who we've been, what we've been given, who he is, and where we've proved that we've proven worthy, not worthy of his grace, because we could never be worthy of such a gift. But where we have proven that we have chosen him, that we will obey, and that this is what we want, that we have proven worthy through receiving and submitting to the will of God so that we are fulfilling our role in that covenant. It's all of those things. It's not one. It's all of those things. And God has said, don't rely on your own understanding. So we need to seek what he's saying and not sit here and try to like debate these things based on our own understanding, but sit with him and say, okay, here's what I'm understanding of scripture. Here's what I'm understanding of what's in your word. Now here's where I'm struggling. Please help me to understand. And then we believe and trust in his sovereignty and his ability to make us understand by his spirit. Now, I'm hearing a lot of stories, actually, more recently of people being called. I told you not that long ago that there would be people coming in who are being called and who are responding, who are actually responding. Thank God, because I am so sick of working with people who could care less and just feel entitled to everything that they've learned in counterfeit Christianity. First of all, it won't be to your credit. Second of all, you will not receive what you think you're going to receive. If that's what you think, you think you don't have to show up on Sabbath, you don't have to be there for the body of Christ, you don't have to observe God's holy days, you don't have to do anything, you will not receive any of the promises that God has made to his people because you're not bearing the fruit of being his people. The stories that I'm hearing, you know, I heard a story tonight about someone who, um, had had these like like kind of intermittent uh, relationships with God or uh, maybe communications with him or felt close to him at different periods. I also had that experience where I would, you know, I, I did have a relationship with him. I went through some really heavy and serious things in my life that he, he took me through. And yet it was not the same thing as being called. I had not been called yet. I had not tasted of the heavenly gift, and and there is a difference, and I wouldn't have known the difference then, but I know the difference now. So you hearing this, if you haven't been called, you may not know the difference yet because you don't have the comparison, but I'm going to tell you what it's like. I had very low moments in my life uh, when I would return to God. I would call out to God, and he did respond to me. I did not know Christ, though surely it was Christ who was responding to me because he's the one who does this work. The Father makes the plan, the Son executes the plan, the Holy Spirit testifies to the plan. So so surely it was Jesus instructing the Holy Spirit, and it was the Holy Spirit who was talking to me. I've shared this with you previously. A relationship would end, and he would tell me, you need to put me first. But I did not have the capacity. I could not put him first. I was so compelled in my own woundedness, I did not trust him. I did not believe that he could actually fill that gaping hole inside of me. And he would dust me off and put me back together again. And then I would meet some man and I would go off with that man. And I would think this is a lot easier. It's a lot easier for a human being to make you feel better than to have to do the work to, you know, to feel better in God. So I would continually spurn him and reject him for a human being. Now let's contrast this with when he called me. When he called me, he had brought me so low to the brink of death. I had been 
extremely ill for seven years, progressively ill for seven years, finally to the brink of death, and he began to prove Christ to me. No one can know the Son unless the Father draws them to him, and no one can get to the Father but through Christ. So that has to happen. You have to be drawn to Christ, and you have to be called. And so that began a series of teaching. It began a wooing process, a proving process of God pulling me out of bondage, of telling me, of convicting me of the things that I needed to repent for, of leading me and guiding me and speaking to me in the spirit. So surely he had spoken to me in the spirit before, but now he was really pouring into me and he would speak very, very clearly to me, not audibly, in the spirit so that I could not make that up. And then he started to withhold a little bit. And it's not that he wasn't there with me, but now he was training me how to listen to him in every aspect of my life so that when I'm looking at what's going on in nature, I'm thinking, what's God doing right here? So that when I'm dreaming at night, I'm wondering, what's God speaking to me? So that when memories are coming up, he's sending affliction to my body. I have certain feelings or sensations. I am always asking, what are you doing? How are you trying to get my attention? Because he wants me to pant for him, to crave him, to listen for him in every aspect of my life, my circumstances, my soul, everything. So don't think that you are losing the presence of God if he calls you and he's speaking to you very clearly, and then he starts to quiet a little bit. It's not that he has left you. He wants you to follow where he's going. And so now you need to pant for him. You need to crave him. Now, I liken this to kind of what we call hard to get. And I don't want to, I don't really want to say that God is playing hard to get because I think that's kind of, you know, reductionistic. But run with me for a minute. When you are in a relationship and someone is just making themselves available to, constantly available to you, you don't appreciate them because they don't really respect themselves. They're just sort of glomming onto you. They're not really valuing themselves or wanting to set up a situation in which you're valuing them. Well, God is perfect and he knows how to make us value him. He knows how to make us pant for him. He knows how to, so like if you're reading Song of Songs and you see how, you know, one minute they're, you know, they're together and, oh, everything's wonderful and you're so beautiful and you're beautiful and all of this. And then he leaves and she's feeling that longing. Oh my goodness. When will I see my love again? Right. And then he comes to the door and her heart is racing and pounding. That's our love story with God. We're always panting. We're always wanting more. Give me more. I want more of you. And if we never feel that longing, then we never feel the want or the need to chase him, to pant for him. And maybe we start to take him for granted, huh? I mean, we've done that without, without even good reason when we weren't hearing from him all the time. So he's going to set up a situation in which you get a taste of that heavenly gift. You get a taste of that love story. And now he's going to train you to pant for it. Every fiber of your being is going to chase him. Now that's only being called. Did you know that? That is only being called. It does not mean you're chosen. And I want to tell you something. There are so many people who credit themselves for what God is doing. I see it all the time where they credit themselves because they're hearing from God. That's just what God's doing for you. That's not going to be to your credit. What will be to your credit is whether or not you obey, whether or not you start to get, you start to start stripping all of that world and all of those worldly ideas and that arrogance and pride and, you know, you die of yourself in order for Christ to live in you. So you become nothing so that he can become great. You cannot be chosen if you don't obey, if you don't bear the fruit of Christ living in you. There's no way. So there are a lot of people who will taste of the heavenly gift, but let me tell you what Paul says about that. It is impossible, okay? That's a definitive. It is impossible for those who have once been enlightened, who have tasted the heavenly gift, who have shared in the Holy Spirit, who have tasted the goodness of the word of God and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away to be brought back to repentance. Once you experience what I just described, you cannot 
fall away. If you do, it's impossible for you to be brought back to repentance. To their loss, they are crucifying the Son of God all over again and subjecting him to public disgrace. Land that drinks in the rain. Now listen to this because it sounds a little funky the way that he's saying this, but you need to listen to it with regard to fruit. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling it on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed. Now, for whom is your crop being farmed? God and the Lamb. You are supposed to be bringing the first fruits to God and the Lamb. They're the ones for whom you are even producing that crop. You're supposed to be bringing that offering to them. You are an offering. You're a sacrifice. Land that drinks in the rain. What's rain? Living water. Holy Spirit. Land that drinks in the rain, often falling on it, and that produces a crop useful to those for whom it is farmed, receives the blessings of God. But land that produces thorns and thistles is worthless and is in danger of being cursed. In the end, it will be burned. All right. So there's your distinction between called and chosen. And there is also your explanation regarding predestination. You've been predestined. Nothing is a surprise to God. It grieves him. I mean, just because you know about something ahead of time, when you're seeing it, it's incredibly grievous and infuriating. And and listen, there there's only so much that we can understand of this right now in our condition. We need not lean on our own understanding. So if there are aspects of this that are difficult for you to grasp, you need to bring them back to God. Ask him because he's capable. I'm not capable of making you understand, but he is. And so what I want to say to you is that all of it is true. And if it's difficult for you to hold all of it, that we are predestined and yet we also have responsibility. Paul addressed it. So why does God blame us? Well, who are you to talk back to God? The potter is allowed to make anything he wants out of the clay. And furthermore, the word says, woe to those who quarrel with your maker, those who are nothing but pot sherds among the pot sherds on the ground. Does the clay say to the potter, what are you making? Does your work say the potter has no hands? Woe to the one who says to a father, what have you begotten? Or to a mother, what have you brought to birth? Okay, so God has already addressed this. We don't get to say that to him. We just obey. We just believe. We just read the word and believe what it says and rend our heart to understanding what he has established and why. And the way that we do that is we ask God, hey, I'm struggling with this one. Please turn my heart and minister to me. And then we believe that he will. Because remember that James said, ask anything in his name and believe that he will give it to you. But if you don't believe, if you doubt You're like a wave of the sea blown and tossed by the wind. You have to believe and you have to ask with the right motives. You have to ask for the will of God, not for your own will. When you start understanding what it means to actually pray in God's name, it is going to be a game changer because what you're going to do instead of doing that thing that they do in counterfeit Christianity in the name of Jesus Christ, amen, which is nowhere in the Bible, the reason they were saying in the name of Jesus Christ was to reveal the glory of God and to reveal the name in whom they were performing certain miracles. But nowhere in the Bible does it say in the name of Jesus Christ, amen. It doesn't. And God taught us, Christ taught us to pray. So if he wanted us to close up our prayer that way, he would have told us to do that. But the name of God is his will, his purpose, his reputation, what he stands for. So if you start praying in the will of God, rather than for your own motives, it's going gonna, it's gonna to completely change everything. Now listen to what James says in James 4. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires to battle that battle within you? You desire but do not have, so you kill. You covet, but you cannot get what you want, so you quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask God. And when you ask, you do not receive because you ask with the wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Oh, how I wish that all of counterfeit Christianity would have to read that every single day with their prosperity gospel and their false prophets coming in and saying, wealth is your portion. God wants to buy you a house. I mean, all of this falsehood and ridiculousness that is accepted 
and received by wicked hearts. Oh, yes, I receive that. Oh, it's so hard for me to receive it, but I receive it. Come on. That's so ridiculous. Pray in his name. Pray for his will. Be like Solomon in the beginning. Maybe not at the end, okay? In the beginning, Solomon prayed for wisdom because he wanted to lead the people right. And then he married foreign women and he chased their gods. So, But the, in the beginning, his heart was in the right place. He wanted wisdom and he wanted to do right by God. And you remember that God gave him wisdom as would never be given before, given again and added everything else unto him. That's exactly what he promises us. So you got to have the right heart. If you want the things of God, then rend your heart to God and to what is important to him and everything else will be added to you. I hope this helps, Brian. If there's any other part of this that I did not cover that you're wondering about, please comment in the comment section. Let me know and I'll make sure that I do a follow-up. Thank you for listening. Please discern this message with God.